We are one, we are one, we are one, we are one, we are one boys, together we are one. Let's sing together, together we are one. Okay, hello, good evening, good afternoon, wonderful teachers of Ukraine. Thank you ever so much for joining us today. Um, as ever, it's a great, great pleasure to have you with us at National Geographic Learning for another Ukraine exclusive webinar. The world is an amazing place. And I'm hoping that that song, that video, got you really in the mood, got you focused, got you engaged um, in anticipation, in readiness for today's session. Um, so hello, my name is Alex Warren and I work as a senior ELT academic consultant at National Geographic Learning. And also with me today is my colleague, Ellie Setterfield, and she will be taking the main presentation a little bit later on. Okay, uh, before we start the presentations uh, in, in full, um, just a little bit of housekeeping, okay? Um, we are definitely gonna be using the chat box a lot during the session, and I can see all of you already found the chat box. Please use that for chat. Do not use the Q&A for just basic chat. Use the Q&A box for very specific questions, okay? And we will answer those throughout the session as they come up. So please just use the chat box where you can. And then I think we also have the kind of icons for hands up, clap and thumbs up and stuff, which we'll also use. Uh, the session is being recorded. So if you have to leave at any point, don't worry. We will share a link to the recording with you post webinar. Post webinar, we will also share a certificate which will come directly from our partners in Ukraine, National Geographic Learning Ukraine, Linguist. Okay, so they will send you a certificate in the next five business working days. It will not come automatically because we have to send them out individually. So please be patient when it comes to that. So today's session is going to split into two parts. Um, I'm going to start by doing a very brief 15 minute course overview for our brand new 
title for young learners called Look, um, which is coming to the Ukraine market right now. Um, please contact your representatives at Linguist and they will be able to give you more information. Um, so let's make a start on that. So um, what is Look? Well, Look is a seven level series for young learners of English from A1 to B1 or pre A1 to B1. Um, so six to 11 year olds. Um, and well, let's show you another video to give you more information about it, right? Um, here goes. National Geographic explorer Shabana Bazig Rasik is an amazing person. She believes that girls should have the same chances as boys. They should be able to go to college and have good jobs and become leaders of their country, just like men. But some things are the same in space. The astronauts get up in the morning and they brush their teeth. My favorite town is called Bodrum. My mum is from Bodrum. It's beautiful. Wow, it is beautiful. It is next to the Aegean Sea. Look at the water. It's so blue. Okay, so hopefully that makes you feel excited about this new title. Um, so what makes look different to all of the other young learner titles out there? Um, many, many things. Um, and we'll quick look at the, the key features, okay? And anyone who's used National Geographic learning titles before will see, you know, all of those great National Geographic Learning features throughout the, uh, throughout the course. Um, so what are those key features? Well, it's really about seeing something real, about bringing the classroom or bringing the world to the classroom and of course, the classroom to life. Jana, great that you're already thrilled. Um, so how do we do this? We do it through amazing photography, authentic stories, video, and inspiring National Geographic explorers. Everything you see in National Geographic Learning Titles, including look, is real. Real people, real places, real culture. We are taking the students on a journey around the world, every corner of the world, in fact. So, you know, here's a map of the world. Where do we take them? We take them to Thailand. We take them to China, New Zealand, Africa, Kenya. We take them to the Arctic. 
We take them to the Antarctic. We take them to Brazil, to Bolivia, to America. We take them around Europe. Literally, it's like a geography lesson for them um, through video, through photos, through stories. Um, so it's really bringing the world to life for them in that respect and makes learning English, and this is the important thing, it makes learning English meaningful. It makes it relevant. It makes it engaging and interesting. So that's one of the key features. Another key feature is, of course, the use of National Geographic Explorers. Uh, and these features throughout the levels with videos, with their stories of what they do. Um, and, and their real world experiences, essentially. So what is a National Geographic Explorer? That's a great question. What do they do? Are they just explorers? Do they go and discover new things? No, of course not. They do all kinds of different things. They do inspirational things. And that's what we want to do here with Look. We want to inspire our learners to be whatever they want to be. So that might be a paleoanthropologist. It might be a marine conservationist. It might be a NASA engineer, a photographer, a polar explorer, biologists, filmmakers, cartographers, or indeed the real term of explorer, an adventurer. So we wanna show students that they can be, they can do whatever they want. And we can do that through the real world content. We do it through these inspiring National Geographic explorers. So that's another key feature of the course. Another one is the projects where we really do take the students on a school trip, um, taking them to amazing locations to meet incredible people. Um, they are incredible photos, right? Um, so yeah, every school trip lesson includes a reading part, a video comprehension, and then a project. And you don't need me to tell you how much young learners love doing projects. It's putting what they're learning into action. It adds to the meaningful, the richness of the learning experience. Another really big key feature of Look is there is also an exam focus within it. It's not explicit, but it's implicit for the students and the activity types they're doing. Uh, and this is our first young learner title that does have a little bit of a focus on exams. In other words, we're teaching for success. Um, and it creates an environment where students are relaxed, they're confident in their abilities. It gives them opportunities to show what they've learned without any stress. So don't think, oh, it's all exams. It's not all exams. It really isn't. But there are exam type questions there which help them to prepare. Like I said, it's not explicit in the student's book, but it is explicit within the teacher's book. So in terms of what it covers, of course, it covers those Cambridge exams, starters, movers, and flyers, as well as the Trinity Jesse exams as well for levels one to five. So, and within the courses, every task type from those exams are focused and modeled in the student's book and the workbook activities, ensuring student exposure, student practice. And as we know, you know, assessment nowadays is it's a really important part of, of students' progression development. And it doesn't have to be summative assessment, but also formative assessment as well. So there are additional assessments for, for the teachers. There's parent-teacher support material. There's guidance on evaluating student performance within the teacher's book. There's formative assessment and remedial activities within the teacher's book. There are full exam practice tests available to the teachers, as well as an exam view uh, assessment suite, which allows you to create your customized uh, tests. Okay. So those are the key features. What does the actual course look like as a whole? What does the unit look like? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, this is what a unit looks like. So there are seven lessons in every single unit, okay? And they're short and sweet. They're not kind of over the top, they're easy to get through, okay? 
Um, and I should say that there are, um, 12 units in each of the levels apart from the starter unit. The starter unit's got 10 units, but all the others have 12 units with eight pages per unit. Um, so you've got the unit opener, you've got vocabulary one, you've got grammar, you've got reading, you've got more grammar. And I should say, when I say grammar, it isn't grammar as, you know, here's the present simple. It's done in a much more communicative based way through songs, through chants. OK, um, there are, of course, additional songs and chants which link specifically to values. So this whole idea of 21st century values is key to the philosophy of look, as well as developing the other 21st century skills of communication, collaboration, critical thinking and creativity. It's kind of embedded within the DNA of what we do at National Geographic Learning and within our Young Learner titles. We have the songs and chants. We have phonics for the lower levels. That's important to know. So the, for levels um, one, two, and three, we have phonics. Then levels four, five, six, it is more of a writing lesson. So there's that very definitive split between the, the levels. Um, there's then an additional video lesson, and this will vary. This might be a National Geographic Explorer a video. Um, but it also might be a video where we interview children from all around the world, um, answering different questions in a kind of a role play kind of scenario, which we then get your students to do as well. So they're really getting to meet some people from all over the world. Um, each unit, well, not every unit, but units also have additional functional lessons and games. These are every third unit. Projects are every second unit, or the, the, the school trips along with the project. So there's, there's four of these per level. And another feature is the additional extended reading. So these are based either on uh, more non-fiction type texts, but also these kind of moral stories as well. So this one's called The Man Who Wanted a Simple Life. And these kind of value stories, these traditional stories, folk tales, come from all around the world. So they're not focusing on any particular culture. Um, and there's also reviews as well, every two units. For the teacher, of course, there's a great supportive teacher's book, but really what we're looking at here is the digital support because in the current climate, you cannot have a course without great digital content and look 100% supports this. Okay, um, we have our very own online learning platform that comprises the classroom presentation tool for the teacher, online practice for the students and a learning management system where teacher can see student progress. So the classroom presentation tool is a fully interactive version of the student's book and workbook, all in one place, really important to note. All of the video or the audio is in one place and there are additional games and activities which are exclusive to the classroom presentation tool. So therefore, of course, helping the process of teaching online tremendously, as well as, of course, in the face-to-face -face class. Um, the online practice is mobile responsive. They can use it on their tablets, on their phones, or on their laptops. It has audio and video from the book more games, workbook activities for assessment preparation, as well as progress reports for the students and their parents and the teacher. But the teacher accesses it through the learning management system, which again is mobile responsive, has all of the teacher resources on there. You can manage your class, you can assign homework, you can run progress reports, and you can contact your students directly through email. It covers everything. Cover Q and A's in the books. Uh, I'll come back to those later. Okay. Um, so just as a very quick, quick roundup, because this is just a very brief overview of the course for you. Um, what is there for you and your learners? So for the, for the learners, you've got the work, the students' book. You've got workbook with online practice. There is a reading anthology as well for every level. So there's an additional reading book 
for every level with six stories in each. And there's online student resources. For the teacher, you've got the student's book, the teacher's book with the student's book, audio and DVD, classroom presentation tool, exam view software to create your own tests, flashcards for starter to level three, including a teacher's guide with loads of great games and activities to do. You've got the learning management system to set assignments, run reports on your students, grade books, so you can see how they are progressing. And there are additional teacher resources. But for more information, please head to the website for Look, which I'm gonna put in the chat box for you. eltngl.com forward slash look. And you can get lots more information there and you can download sample units as well to try out with your students, okay? Okay, so that's just a really brief overview of the course. Um, very sort of informational, very kind of factual for you. But I'm now gonna hand over to my colleague, Ellie Setterfield, who is gonna be presenting her wonderful talk. So I'm gonna stop sharing. I will be in the background still. So if you do have questions, I will answer them in the Q&A box for you, okay? So over to you, Ellie. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much, Alex. And thanks for such a brilliant introduction to the course. We're gonna be using some more examples from Look in the content that I'm going to share with you in a moment, but we're also gonna look at some other ideas and things that you can use in your classrooms at the moment. So you will see how they can be used with Look, but also how they can be used with whatever course books you are using right now. Just before we get started, a little bit of introduction about me. So hello everyone, my name is Ellie and I am the Young Learner Product Marketing Executive for National Geographic Learning. So I look after all of our books that are for primary and pre-primary kindergarten age groups and I work both with our editorial teams when we're creating the books but also with lots and lots of teachers like yourselves as well doing things like teacher training and helping out with questions and queries that people might have about the books and how they can use them in their classrooms. But before I started working for National Geographic Learning, I was a teacher myself. And you're gonna see some examples in this presentation from things that I have done in my own classes with my own students as well. So it's lovely to meet you all and to see you all this afternoon. Um, I'm going to share my screen with you all now. So hopefully you can see that, okay. Just going to get the chat over so I can see the chat. Okay, fantastic. Can you all see my screen okay? Yep. Brilliant. Okay, fantastic. That's a great start. Okay, so what we're going to be talking about in today's session is creativity. And if you read the, uh, like the little blurb, the little summary that came out before signing up for this talk, you'll see that I referred to a quote by Ken Robinson. And Ken Robinson gave a TED talk that is still currently the most talk of all time. It's a really, really famous TED talk. But it's also, I think, really interesting as a teacher and someone with a teaching background because he spoke about creativity and he said that it's as important in education as literacy and should be treated with the same status. And that's really why I wanted to talk about this in today's session, because when I read that, I thought actually, and when I heard that, I thought that's really interesting because actually, sometimes I think we do give creativity that very important status in our classrooms, but sometimes we don't, do we? I think sometimes, we end up thinking that literacy and grammar and vocabulary are the things that we need to be focusing on and not creativity because sometimes creativity takes a little bit more work and a bit more creativity from us as well. So we're gonna start off by thinking about what creativity actually is. Now, I've got some different quotes for you on the next slide. 
And if you look carefully, you'll see that each of them I have labelled. So we've got A, B, C, D and E. You can see them now. I'd like you to type in the chat, which one of these quotes do you like best? I realise I could have set this up as a poll, actually, and I didn't do that. So sorry. But which one do you like best? So have a read. And then A, B, C, D or E, which one favourite one of these quotes? It's got an A, E, D, quite a few Ds. C, C, A, C, E, D. Lots of Ds, A, some more A's, lots of A's as well. Someone says they like all of them. Yeah, I quite like all of them as well, actually. They show a bit of a different angle, don't they? They're all saying some elements that are a little bit similar, but some things that are different as well about creativity. So there's no right or wrong answer to this. They're all equally valid things. But I just wanted to share these with you because they all display a slightly different element to creativity, don't they? Some of them, for example, B, talks more about why it's important and what the role is of creativity. But then some you have more folks focusing more specifically on what actually it is, like D and E, for example, they're trying, and A as well, I guess, so they're kind of trying to give a slightly more specific definition. So I think the overall outcome we can get from this is there is not necessarily any right or wrong answer. And there's not really any true definition as such. All of these are important and they share slightly different ideas. But why is creativity important and why is it relevant to our young learners? Why does Ken Robinson think that it's so vital for us to be teaching our young learners? What do you think? But OK, so to make classes interesting or fascinating. Yep, definitely. Any other thoughts? Why is creativity so important for our young learners? To develop their imagination. Yep, that's a very good point as well. Develop thinking skills. Yep. It helps you react quickly and find better ways to teach. Very much so. It opens their minds. It's a core skill. Helps them have fun, helps them broaden their thoughts. It's motivating. They'll use it in their lives. Yeah, brilliant. Okay, fantastic. Some really, really good ideas here. Really good examples of why creativity is just so important for our learners. I think actually you've covered quite a lot of them, but these are just some of the things that I came up with. So firstly, using language itself is a creative act. When we're using a language, we're transforming our thoughts into language that can be heard or that can be read. We produce sentences, we produce paragraphs or even longer texts that we have not heard or read or seen before. And that in itself is being creative. If our learners don't have the language that they need in order to communicate, they need to use creative strategies in order to get their point across. If you're trying to communicate something and you don't know the vocabulary, then you're probably going to mime or maybe draw or maybe just paraphrase it, try and use other words that you do know in order to explain what you mean. And all of those things require creativity. They're all creative means of expression. Now, when we ask learners to be creative in solving problems, we're asking them to find their own solutions. We ask them to see what they can do, often independently of us, often independent of the teacher. They're able to see what they can do and what they're capable of achieving. And this builds learner autonomy and increases their self-esteem. 
Now, lots of us have said that creativity is a really important skill. And just part of the reason why it's so important is because it can lead to genuine communication and cooperation, which is ultimately what we want to achieve in our lessons, isn't it? When we ask learners to complete a creative task, they tend to focus on the end goal. They're not focusing on the process or what they're doing. They're focusing on what they need to achieve at the end of it. And this means that the language gets used naturally. It gets used as a tool for communication. When teaching young learners, we want to bear in mind that we are developing the whole child. As well as developing their knowledge of English, we're also developing their social skills, their ability to collaborate and work with others. By incorporating elements of creativity in the young learner classroom, we are helping them to develop these other secondary skills. Now, lots of you I know have said about it making learning more interesting, making it more varied, making it motivating. And creative activities make our lessons more varied. They make them more enjoyable. They cater for learners of different abilities. And they cater for those students who might be a bit weaker in terms of certain aspects of language learning where their strengths may lie in other areas or in other subjects. And finally, I think some people have mentioned, I'm pretty sure I saw this in the chat as well, creative thinking is an important 21st century skill. It's a skill that our young learners are going to need to use, both as they progress throughout their education and in the future as well, when they leave education, when they move into the world of work, it's an important skill that they will need for their future. It's something that they are going to be using almost every day. So we're going to think a little bit about how we can foster creativity. First of all, how can we create creativity? How can we encourage creativity and how can we do that in our classroom? Well, the first thing we can do is to consider the classroom environment. So if we're teaching face to face, we can think about the physical environment that we're in. We can consider trying out different classroom layouts, particularly for group activities or if learners are working at learning stations, for example. But even if we're not teaching online at the moment, or we're teaching sometimes online and sometimes in the classroom, we can provide opportunities for students to work together, to discuss and to collaborate. We can use things like breakout rooms, for example, to facilitate that group work or pair work as we would do in our physical classroom. To nurture creativity, our students need the freedom to offer ideas and to express themselves without judgment. And they need to be aware that all contributions are welcomed. Now that leads us to our next element of encouraging creativity. And that is that we need to encourage our learners to take risks. Being creative requires us to look at things in different ways to try things that are maybe a bit different, that are maybe outside of the established pattern of doing things. Now, it's obvious then that creativity requires a certain amount of risk-taking. We might suggest things that don't actually work. We might try something and it might fail. We need to create an environment where our learners feel safe and they feel able to get things wrong. So how can we do that? Well, we can encourage our learners to try new ideas. We can ask them to come up with a mind map or a brainstorm to think of as many different ideas as possible and then choose the best ideas and improve upon those. But in that first crucial stage, anything is valid. Doesn't matter if it sounds crazy, doesn't matter if you don't think it will work, it's still a valid idea. And we can invite our learners to evaluate their own performance. We can ask them what worked 
and what didn't. If, for example, we're doing a project, we'll talk a little bit more about projects later, we can ask our learners, what do you think went well? If you did this again, what would you change? What would you do differently? Maybe what didn't work so well? And why do you think that was? Now, a vital part of encouraging our learners to take risks in their English language lessons is by creating a positive classroom environment. We need to create an environment where we, and also their classmates, praise and are supportive of each other. Being positive can have a hugely beneficial impact both on our students' attitudes and our students' behaviour in class, but also a huge impact on their learning as well. And I wanted to share this piece of research by the author and trainer Jack Canfield because I thought this really hits home how much actually we need to encourage our young learners, we need to praise them, we need to help them feel supported and like what they're doing and what they're trying is a good and positive thing. Now we're going to have a think a bit now about activities that we can do to develop creativity. So we've looked at some of the things that we can do to try and encourage creativity. We can think about the classroom layout. We can encourage our learners to take risks. We can make sure that we're having, uh, we're fostering a supportive environment. But what sort of activities can we do? to develop creativity in our classrooms? Let me know in the chat box. Okay, so we've got make video speeches. Yep, brainstorming, project work, role play. Good, nice idea so far. Play games, dialogues. Lots of people saying projects, speaking activities. Never vote for games, projects. Guessing games, association games, role play, having a round table, yet yeah, doing discussion type activities, crafts, quizzes, storytelling, games, songs, writing stories, writing activities, research, using different apps. Fantastic. Yeah, lots and lots of really nice ideas there. Thank you. So I think you're all on the right lines there are. There are lots of really nice activities that we can do with our students to encourage that creativity and to develop those creative skills. Now, the things that we're gonna be talking about in this session fall into four kind of main categories. This isn't to say these are the only ways that we can encourage creativity. Lots of you I can see you've already mentioned other things, other ways, but we're just going to look at four different types of ways today because obviously we only have a limited length of time and we could spend the whole day talking about different activities that we can do. So the things that we're going to be talking about are songs, chants and raps. So I can see some of you have mentioned songs already. We're going to be talking about projects and lots and lots of you have mentioned projects and I know Alex was talking about projects as well in his introduction when he was talking about look. We're going to talk about games and as a kind of subset of games we're also going to talk about role plays and pretend games because these things can be a little bit different to how we think of as traditional games. They're a slightly different way of doing things. So let's get started. We're going to start off by thinking about songs and chants. And I'd like to know, firstly, what are your favourite songs and chants to use with your young learners? And also, why do you use them? Is there a specific reason why you like using these songs and chants? So Natalia says Baby Shark, yep, action song, thrilling, yep. Let me find the wrong one. Alex, are you aware that your audio's on? I wasn't. I will mute you. <laughs> 
Okay, so if you're happy, yeah. Uh -huh, yeah, okay, so to, lots of people talking about action songs, they're getting students moving, they're getting them uh, moving around, maybe warming up. I'm a music man, uh-huh, fantastic. I don't think I know that one. Phonics chants, dance free, take a breaky. Uh-huh, okay, so another reason for using songs there, they can create atmosphere. They're fun. Okay, brilliant, thank you. Ah, yes, good, and they can raise students' mood. They can encourage our learners to get a bit more involved, get a bit more excited. If we've got a group of students who are feeling particularly sleepy on any given day, or they're not really focusing, for example. Okay, fantastic. Thank you for all of those ideas. And there's lots of songs that there are quite a few songs I know, but there are a few songs there that I don't know already. So I'll have to have to look into some of those ones. OK, thank you for all of your ideas. There are some really good ideas. So these are just some of the things that I came up with as to why we might use songs in our classroom. Firstly, they are fun and lots of you have said that they're fun. Our students enjoy doing songs and learning songs and chants and singing them and performing them in our classroom, don't they? They allow us to do something a bit different, to change the pace of the lesson, uh, to often to get our learners up and moving around. That's something that they enjoy. Songs are easy to remember. The very nature of a song where you've got the, the lyrics, the words, and you've also got the tune or the rhythm. It makes it rhyme, it makes it repetitive, it makes it easy to remember those words. And often you end up with them stuck in your head for hours afterwards. I'm sure lots of us are slightly at the moment singing the song from Look that Alex played at the beginning and I've got a couple more songs that are coming up in this that will hopefully get stuck in your heads and you'll be singing those all afternoon as well. Now songs can also help our learners to build fluency. They introduce that language but also they can encourage our learners to maybe speak a bit more faster, to speak a bit more fluently than they would do naturally. It shows them what the natural intonation and the natural rhythm is for those words. And by copying it, they can adopt some of that fluency as well. Now, several of you have said about doing lots of practice of language. And one of the reasons why songs are great is because they provide meaningful language practice. It allows us to practice pronunciation, it allows us to practice vocabulary and grammar, but it's not boring. If we're singing a song, often our learners are happy to sing the same song lots of different times or to sing it in several different lessons, for example. And there are not many activities that our learners will happily do over and over again. But because songs are fun, they help us to achieve that. They mean that our learners don't mind doing the same thing more than once. So they provide them with lots and lots of practice. They also help us to build and develop a classroom community. When we've done a particular song with our class, that is something that all of our learners share together. They all know this particular song. They all know the words. They all know maybe the actions that go with it. And we'll talk a bit more about actions in just a moment. But it helps to develop that classroom community, that sense of everyone being part of something together. And as at the beginning, we talked about wanting to create a classroom environment where everything is supportive, where our learners feel encouraged, and that comes from their classmates as well, not just from the teachers. We can see that actually creating a classroom where our students have got these things in common can be really valuable. Now, finally here, our songs are age appropriate as well, aren't they? Our students 
use songs or chants or things in their first language outside of classroom, outside of the classroom. It doesn't matter if they're all just sitting around and listening to a song on one of their phones or if they're playing a game that's got a particular song or chant that goes with it. Songs are something that is a part of our young learners' lives, and they are a natural thing for our students to do. We sing to our babies or to our children. We introduce them to different activities and games and things that have songs as a part of them. So they're a natural part of being a child or being a young learner. Now, I said that we were going to look at some examples of songs and chants. And the first ones that I wanted to show you are just a couple of examples of chants. Now, Alex mentioned at the beginning when he was doing his introduction to look that look introduces grammar through means of songs and chants. And I just wanted you to see some examples of how this works in practice here. So this is a very low level example. This is from level one and quite near the beginning of level one as well. It's from unit two. But here you can see we're practicing this structure here. We're practicing this. This is my and then the item of vocabulary. But by putting it into a chant, we've got lots of repetition but it's in a very natural kind of context. It's a natural way to be repeating that language. And we've also got all of that vocabulary recycled there. I wanted to show you how that works at a slightly higher level. So we've got an example from level three here, but in this one, we've got more language involved. So I wanted to draw your attention to this one just because it gives you some ideas as well in the teacher's book, how you can use it. You can see here, you've got two different parts to this. You've got the part that's in green and the part that's in purple. So with our class, we could split the class into two halves, for example, and get each half of the class to perform their lines in the chant. So one half is green, one half is purple. We can encourage them to see who can do it the best or maybe who can do it the loudest or if we need to calm everyone back down, who can maybe do it the quietest. But we can get lots of variety in terms of how we use it as well. And although we're still fundamentally practicing that grammar, we can make it into a fun part of the lesson as well. Now you can see another example here. This one is a little bit different because this isn't grammar, this is a phonics one. So here we're practicing those R blends. So those br and cr and dr and fr sounds here. So this is a phonics chant, but as you can see, you've got lots of vocabulary that you wouldn't necessarily relate to each other, but because of the fact that it's part of a song, it means that our learners can actually use it in a fairly natural context and they can get some practice of all of those words together. Okay, now we're gonna think a little bit about adding movement to songs or chants now. So lots of you said that movement is a really good reason why you use songs in your lesson. It gets our learners moving. It gets our learners up and about and doing things in their lesson. And it means that we're not just sitting still the whole time. It makes things a little bit more exciting and a bit more interesting. But there are other reasons why we might want to use songs with actions as well. Can anyone help me out here? Why do we use songs with actions? What are some of the advantages to using songs with actions or with movement to them? Why do we do that? Or why might we do that in our classroom? Hmm. 
need to press that. So yeah, okay, so it gives them a brain break, it involves them, helps them to remember words of a song. Uh-huh, shows the meaning of words. Good, it helps them to relax, TPR, for fun and better understanding. Definitely, yeah, children like to move and they can't sit still for a long time. Have a rest between parts of the lesson. You remember it better. Fantastic, brilliant. Yeah, you're all experts on using songs with movements, I see. So some of the reasons I had, they're more engaging. They help students to remember the song better. So if we're associating the action with the words, it helps our students to remember it more. And it does help our students to understand the lyrics of the song as well. If our learners are a little bit weaker maybe, and there is some vocabulary in the song that they don't really know, or they're potentially going to forget, there are there is evidence that using movement to accompany, oops, sorry, I pressed the wrong button there. Uh, there is evidence that using those, um, using actions are, is going to help our students to remember what they're hearing. Okay, now I said that there were going to be some songs in this, so Hopefully this will all work okay and you will be able to hear my song. I have clicked to share sound. So fingers crossed, this will work okay. So this is one of the songs from Look and I wanted to share it with you because I think this is a really good example of how we can use a song with actions to it, but also how we can encourage our students to join in with the actions or even come up with the actions themselves because the actions to this song are quite self-explanatory and I think you will be able to tell what the actions might be when we start playing the song. So, okay. I feel like you're all lucky because you're all hiding behind your computer screens and I can't see if you're joining in or not. If we were in a physical uh, conference or if we were at, if I was at your school doing this teacher training, I would be standing up in front of you and doing the actions to the songs with you. But unfortunately, I can't do that here because I don't know if you are or not. So I'm going to do some of the actions to the songs. We'll see if you if you want to join in with me, you can. Okay. Oh, fantastic. Some people are with me. That's good to know. Okay. I'm not going to do all of them, but I'll do, I will do the ones that I can do sitting down. So, okay. I might need to, I might need to heads up. Let me know if you can hear the song. Okay. I'm going to hit play now. Track 76. Unit five. Finally. Yep. Lesson five. Song. Okay. Exercise one. Am I singing? Uh, Listen you want to, and Alex. read. <laughs> Dancing. Yo. 
Okay, thank you for those of you who joined in with me there. <laughs> it is a really catchy song, isn't it? And as you say, it's a nice way to practice body parts that's a little bit different from heads, shoulders, knees and toes, which are often our learners know it and they love it. So there's no reason why we can't use that as well. But sometimes it's nice to have something that is a little bit different. And what we can do with this song is we can encourage our learners to come up with the actions and the movements themselves. We can ask them to show us their finger. We can ask them to point to their nose or we can ask them what they think the actions should be in advance. And then we can practice it all together. Oh, no, please don't stop. Track 76. Okay. Nope. Okay. Don't play again. <laughs> okay, now when our students are familiar with the song, we can take the creativity aspect of it further. So we've spoken a little bit about encouraging our learners to be creative by coming up with the actions to the song, but we can also ask our learners to personalize the song. Now for this, we want to choose a song that has a simple, repetitive structure. And then make sure that we give the students a framework to complete to write their own verse. So we're going to look at an example of this now. I've got another song for you. So if that last one didn't get stuck in your head, hopefully this one will do and you'll be singing it all day. Possibly if you haven't had your dinner yet, this will make you want pizza for your dinner. You will see why in just a moment. Okay, so this is a charm. So it's a little bit different from the song in that it hasn't got quite this, it's not a sung one, it's a chant, it's a bit more like a rap. But it's easy to create new verses to add to the chant using different food vocabulary. So in a moment, I'm gonna play the chant, but I will make it come up a little bit bigger. Track 30. Oh, no, okay, I'm not gonna make it come up bigger. Um, so I'm gonna play the chant so you can hear the structure of it. Track 30, exercise three, listen and chant. What do you want on your pizza? What's your favourite food? What do you want on your pizza? What tastes really good? I like cheese and tomatoes with a bit of onion too. Sometimes I add mushrooms. How about you? What do you want on your pizza? What's your favourite food? What do you want on your pizza? What tastes really good? I like chicken and meatballs with salt and pepper too. Sometimes I add olives. How about you? What do you want on your pizza? What's your favourite food? What do you want on your pizza? What tastes really good? Okay, so I'm going to stop it there because I'm sure you all get the idea. But what we can do with this is we can encourage our students to personalise it. We can give them a framework like this one here. So if you look at the verses of the chant, you'll notice that they all follow the same pattern. For all of the verses, it's I like mm, and mm, with mm, two. Sometimes I add mm. How about you? So we can ask our students to work either on their own or in pairs or maybe in small groups. We can encourage them to fill in the spaces with their own ideas, with vocabulary, that they know. And then we can perform their own verses to the song. So we can get the whole class to do the 
what do you want on your pizza, the chorus, but then each of our individual pairs or groups or students even can in turn perform their own verse. And some of them will probably be sensible and some of them will probably be silly. Every time I look at this, I want to say that I want, I like chocolate and cherries with, hmm, I don't know what would go well with chocolate and cherries. But I think, oh, I've just seen Vera has put a very nice example in the chat there. So Vera says, I like cheese and tomatoes with chicken and mushrooms too. Sometimes I add onions. How about you? Yeah, that's a really nice one. Or yep, Lib Miller's adding jelly to my chocolate and cherry one. I think that would be good as well. So really nice, nice ideas there. Thank you. And thank you very much, Vera, for your contribution there. So as we can see, we're providing our students with a simple framework that they can follow, but then we can allow them to personalize the song, to be a little bit more creative and to put their own stamp on it. As one more example, I'm not gonna play this example for you, but I just wanted to share, here's another example, which is to do with jobs and getting learners to think about different types of jobs and what they do. And then again, we can use a simple framework to encourage our young learners to personalize those words. And again, we can then perform it as a group, not only the song or the chant as it is in the book, but also using our students' own ideas as well. They can choose their own job and think about what this person does. Okay, now we're gonna move on from songs now because I think we've got those nicely in your head. So you will be seeing those later and all wanting pizza for dinner probably. Now we're gonna move on to thinking about projects now. So, in the chat, I would like you to tell me, why do we use projects? What are the reasons why we might use projects with our young learners? Okay, so they might, they develop 21st century skills for the future. Yep, they develop imagination. Good. They give students freedom. Yeah, definitely. Team building. Yes, they encourage our learners to work together. They prepare students for real life. They help them develop their social skills. They do develop creativity. Yes, because after all, what we're talking about today is creativity and how we can develop our learners' creativity. And help them cooperate. Allow them to show, uh -huh, allow students of different levels to show themselves. Very much so. Help them to share interests, brilliant, yes. Lots of really nice ideas there, thank you. So you've covered lots of the things here, but these are the ways that I had. So they're a great way for our students to learn. They appeal to their creativity and their imagination. By doing project work, we get our learners to use their own ideas. And that in itself develops their autonomy as well. If they're choosing what they want to talk about or what they want to research about or coming up with their own ideas about a topic. Projects are interesting, aren't they? They're fun, they keep students engaged. I know my learners have always really enjoyed doing projects. They bring a lot of the language and the content together. So often we do projects at the end of a unit and the project lessons in Look, the school trip lessons, they are situated at the end of units. And the reason for that is because they can tie all of that language and content together. They encourage our learners to recycle it and to use it, but in a natural context. Projects can be done in different ways. They can be done individually or they can be done in groups or in pairs. Depends what we think is gonna work best for that individual project and also what's going to work best for our students. And some of the time we might want to do one, some of the time we might want to do the other. 
And also projects provide something for our learners to share. They provide something that they can show their peers or their parents or maybe even their other teachers if there's something that's going to be displayed on the wall at school, for example, or something that might be shown at a school end of term performance or at a parents evening or something like that. There's something that our learners can be proud of that shows what they have achieved. Now, of course, there are lots and lots of different projects our learners can do. Really, the list of projects is endless. And there are different skills that our learners can develop by doing projects. But I just wanted to share with you a few examples, just so we can talk about some of the skills more specifically that our learners might develop by doing projects. So in this particular project, it's all about research skills. So our learners are going to be finding out about a famous road of some kind, but they've got to use their research skills to find out this information and then share it with the rest of their class. So to some extent it's research, but also to some extent it's also presentation skills as well, because they've got to share what they have learned. Now, sometimes projects can tie in with our students' background knowledge. And you can see an example here. So the project in this lesson kind of has two parts to it. It's partly an acted out role play with a child talking to their grandparent and they're comparing their town in the past and their town now, but it's also writing a biography of the town or another town that they know well. So we're thinking about what our students already know that they can bring in to the lesson. We mentioned that one of the reasons why projects are so great is because it encourages our learners who might be of different levels to participate. And here, we're allowing learners who maybe don't always shine in our English lessons to really have something to contribute. We're allowing them opportunities to bring in other things that they know about, so even if they don't necessarily know the English vocabulary or they maybe are not very good at grammar, they still know things that mean that they can contribute a valuable part to the project. Now, sometimes projects can be linked to our imagination or developing our students' imagination. So you can see here this example of a project. This is purely an imaginative project. We're looking at a museum on the school trip and we're learning about an amazing robot. And then our students' project work is going to be to design a robot and think about what its body parts are, what's it got and what can it do. So here our learners are truly being creative. They're having to come up with their own ideas, use their imagination to see what they can produce. And in our final type of project we've got here, we've got imagination again, because we're thinking about an imaginary place. So not a real place, an imaginary one and what animals might live in this imaginary place. So they could be real animals or maybe they could be dragons and unicorns and fairy tale animals. And then we're going to present the map to the class. So we're not only developing imagination but we are also developing those presentation skills there as well. So we've got a nice combination of skills. We said that project work often ties in lots of different skills together. And this is just an ex one example of how we can do that. So we just wanted to share a few quick tips for using projects, because these are things that are going to help no matter what type of project you are going to be doing in your classroom. Um, Ludmilla, sorry, do you mean that one? Just spot it, sorry, Ludmilla has just asked if we can. Does that help? Brilliant. Okay. 
Sorry for whizzing onwards a little bit quickly. <laughs> okay, so tips for using projects. And no matter what kind of project you are going to do in your class, you want it to be successful, don't you? And here are just some quick tips that are likely to help. So firstly, make sure that you have got clear directions and depending on the age and the level of your students, you might want these to be some visual instructions for what you want to do. So maybe have an example, have a model so they can see what they're going to be asked to create at the end of it and also written directions as well. So we're not only going to tell our learners orally what we want them to do, but also make sure they've got something else that they can refer back to as well to make sure that they are following the instructions and make sure that they're including all of the different parts to their project if it's something that's got more than one component to it. Break the task down into manageable chunks. So one of the things that can be challenging about project work is sometimes that it can be quite overwhelming. If we are told, okay, your project is going to be to design a map of an imaginary place and then present it to the class, that can seem like quite a big thing to do. And our young learners, don't necessarily have the skills to know how to break that down into bits, how to make it more achievable and more approachable. So that's something that we can help support our learners with by breaking it down into steps, by encouraging them, for example, if they're going to be doing some writing, that first they need to make a plan, they need to come up with their ideas, they need to sort their ideas into what order are they going to go in, for example? We need to make sure that we have materials ready for our learners to use. Now, it sounds like a bit of an obvious one, but it's easy to forget when we're planning lots and lots of lessons. We've got a whole day of teaching and this project lesson is just going to be one lesson out of many in our day. But we need to make sure that if our learners are going to be, for example, creating a poster, that either they need to make sure that they are going to bring in, for example, pens and glue and things like that, that they're going to need, or make sure that we are providing that for them. Because if we have the materials ready for our learners to use, that's great, they can get on with it, they can start work. But if we don't have everything for them to work with or they don't have what they need, it's going to delay doing that. It sounds like a bit of an obvious one, but make sure that we're walking around and monitoring learners' progress. I know certainly sometimes when I've been in the classroom and it's been at the end of a long day, it's been quite tempting to think, ah, oh, okay, project, okay, they're working on their own. I don't really need to have too much input but we do still need to make sure that we are walking around and monitoring what they're doing and keeping an eye, lending support, making sure that we are helping them where they need help and staying on topic as well. Often with project work, a valuable part of our role can be making sure that they are sticking to the task they're meant to be doing, completing all of the bits of the task that they're meant to be doing and making sure that they're aware of time as well because it's very easy for our young learners to get embedded and engrossed in doing a task and then suddenly realize oh no we've only got 10 minutes left and we've got all of these other things that we still need to do so that's something that we can support our learners with and finally if we're doing project work in our lessons we need to make sure that our learners are being asked to share that they're getting the opportunity to show what they are doing. In some, time, some, in some types of project, this might be implicit because part of the project or part of the end result is going to be to give a presentation, for example. But other times, if our learners are, for example, creating a poster, it can be easy to forget to give our learners a chance to share their work. But we need to give them opportunities to do that. It will help them to feel pride in their work. 
it will encourage them in many cases to actually produce a better result if they know that other people are going to look at it. And it also gives them the opportunity to be proud of what they've done and to show it to other people. And yeah, I really like that. Yeah, they do. They feel like they're part of something important. So even if it's as simple as displaying their work on the wall in the classroom and getting their classmates to go and have a look at the other group's work at the end of the lesson, or maybe creating a more permanent display where it's going to be up on the wall for the rest of the term, for example, so that other students can see it as well. It's important to give them opportunities to share. Okay, now the final part of this session, we're going to move on to thinking about games. So I'd like to know now, what games do you use in your classes and why do you use games? Okay, so we've got bingo. Yep. Guessing games. Yep. Lots of words bingo. Board games. Uh huh. Lots of words. Board games, miming games, quizzes, hangman, I spy. Good. Okay. Ah, so we've got a couple of reasons coming in for why we might use them as well. So motivate they're motivating they encourage students to communicate yeah any other reasons why we might use games it helps them to remember vocabulary good the chat box is moving very quickly <laughs> because children like them it gives them the opportunity to relax definitely warm up can practice vocabulary and grammar structures it's a great way to learn, to master fluency, to lead in or to warm up. Brilliant, fantastic, really nice ideas there. Ice breaking, because it's fun. Fantastic, yeah, really nice ideas there, thank you. So some of the reasons that I had are, that's how children learn. Children learn by playing or they learn by doing. It's a natural part of being a child and, and of learning. It allows us to focus on different language skills. So it allows us to do lots of different things. It allows us to use vocabulary and grammar, but it also allows us to practice things like speaking and in some cases listening. I spot a broken telephone being suggested there. So that's very good for encouraging our learners to listen very carefully to what other people are saying. Often games are active, aren't they? They give our students another opportunity to let off a bit of steam and to take part in something, to do something that's a bit more physical maybe as a break from sitting and learning. Games are often something very interactive and social. We've said about working in groups and then being uh, involved in speaking and lots of active type things. It's helping our learners to develop those social skills there. Yud Miller, I really like that idea. That's a very good idea. The role playing games is, is like um, reality condensed into a small kind of moment in our lesson. That's a really good summary of role playing games. Definitely, I completely agree with you there. Games are motivating. They're fun, aren't they? Our learners really like playing games. It's something that they enjoy. If we tell them that we're going to play a game, they're going to be enthusiastic about it. On a related note, games are learner centered. We know that this is how our students learn best. We want our lessons to be learner centered, to evolve around our students and what they need and how they are going to learn best and playing games can help us to do that. Games provide a natural meaningful context for language to be used. So as with songs where we said that it gives you the opportunity to use language in a natural way where it makes sense, games also give us an opportunity to do that. And games can also provide a positive way to assess our learners progress as well. So 
where Alex was talking at the beginning of the session about assessment and formative assessment and how in many cases we do need to prepare our young learners for exams, but we don't want to make it too explicit about exams for them. Playing games can be a really good way to give us an insight into our young learners, what they're able to do, what they're not able to do yet, what they could use some more practice on. All of that really valuable information is something that we can often see come to the fore when we are playing a game. Okay, so just wanted to share a few tips for choosing games. So we gave some examples for best practices for using projects, but if we're gonna use games in our lesson, three main things that we need to focus on. We need to make sure that the game teaches or practices language in some way. Ultimately, yes, we want our learners to have fun, but at the end of the day, they are in our lessons to learn. So we need to make sure that there is some element of language learning or practice going on in that game as well. It's not only fun, it has also got some element of language use to it. We need to make sure that the instructions for the game are clear. Now, often we play the same games lots and lots of times with our students. We'll find a game that they really love and then that is something that we will repeat. So it's not so much a problem with that kind of game, but if we are playing a game that is new to our students, something that they haven't come across before or something that they don't have a version of it in their first language, for example, thinking about things like broken telephone, um, that exists in so many different cultures that students are probably familiar with it, no matter where they are from. But if we're playing a game that is completely new to our students, we need to make sure the instructions are clear. They know what they need to do. They know how to play the game. They know how to win the game if it's a game where there is going to be a winner. And we need to make sure fundamentally that we're going to keep it a little bit short and sweet because yes, we love games, we want to play games, but also we want them to be a fun, exciting, novel thing for our students. So we need to be aware of our students' attention spans. We need to be aware of what other activities we're doing as a part of the lesson as well. So we're not only doing games, we're doing other things at the same time. So I wanted to share just a few examples of some games that we have in Look that you could play with your students. So several people mentioned about board games and I just wanted to share a couple of examples of board games with you here. But the reason why I wanted to share these examples is because we can also encourage our learners to be creative with this type of game. So a board game on the face of it, you might think, well, that's not very creative. Normally with most board games, you're going around the board, you're moving your counter, and often the games that we play in our English classroom that are board games, they've got a question of some kind on each square or in each space. But yes, Tanya, you are one step ahead of me. We can, exactly. So a good end of term or end of year revision activity is to get our learners to create their own game, exactly. So we can get our learners to draw out. We can give them a big, big piece of paper, get them to work in pairs or groups to draw out their own board and then to create their own questions that they're going to answer. And then we can get them to swap their board game with another group and play each other's board games, for example. Yes, Lumino, I've done that at summer camp as well. It's a, it's a really nice summer camp activity too. Now, if you want to make it a little bit more exciting than that, and you want to encourage a little bit more creativity and a little bit more moving around, you could also do something like this. You could create a giant board game on the floor. So this one is the same principle. Learners are going to come up with the questions. This one's for quite low level learners. So this one, you've just got simple pictures or letters on each card. Um, and they need to come up with 
um, they need to say what the picture is or they need to come up with a word that begins with that letter on the card. But it could be something more complex than this. But this gives the learners the opportunity to move around physically as well, especially bringing board games to life. Okay, now mustn't forget as well, digital games that we can play. I've just got a few examples here. These are from the online practice for Look, but I remember at the beginning of the session when we were talking about different games, a few people mentioned things like Kahoot, for example. So we can use things like Kahoot or Quizlet to create our own online quizzes or things like that and give our learners some more opportunities to practice games and to play games online as well. So these could be things that we do as a whole class using the interactive whiteboard, or they could be things if our learners are using their own devices, either if they're working at home or we work in an environment where our students can have their own devices in lessons that they can play on their own tablet or on their own mobile phone there. Now, games can also take the form of role plays. And this is the last thing that I wanted to speak to you about today. So role plays, they might be functional ones. They might be ones designed to practice specific language, or they might be more imaginative ones. For example, where learners retell a story that they have heard. So this is, so the example you can see here is more of a functional role play. So here we're practicing language to do with going shopping. Or here you can see activity four here is going to be to role play the story. So they've just read a story and then they're going to act it out in groups. So they're going to recycle the language that they have used they're going to practice that language and also check really their understanding of the story as well by acting it out. But there are ways, again, that we can encourage our learners to maximize their creativity with this. So some of the time with role plays, it might be easier or more practical for us to just do the role play with our learners sitting down at their desks, speaking to each other, just have it as a fairly standard speaking activity. But remember, there are always opportunities for us to make things a little bit more exciting. And I promised that I would show you just a few examples from some of my lessons. So these are these are all examples of things that I've done with my students in the in my classes before. So on the left there, you can see that was when we were doing restaurant dialogues, so a little bit like the one that you've just seen, where you're going to practice not shopping, but vocabulary that you would use to order food in a restaurant or cafe. But we set this up before the lesson, so we had our little restaurant corner, so we could have one of our students would be the waiter or waitress, the other students would be visiting the restaurant and then we'd swap for example so just to make it a little bit more fun a little bit more creative and a little bit more hands-on in terms of practicing our restaurant dialogue I think I seem to recall in that lesson as well my learners also made their own menus so the one you can see on the table there was my example that was the model at the beginning of the lesson but then they made their own menus for their restaurant as well the two pictures in the middle, this was practicing places in the town. So what we had to do in those ones, my learners um, were asked to create a town. We had this really amazing classroom that had all of these bricks and blocks and toys and things in it. So I asked my learners with these to, gave them a very rigid time limit, but asked them to make different places in a town and then they had to label it. And then they had to give their classmates some um they had to give their classmates a tour of their town so they had to show them where all the different places were and the one on the right there looks like playing in the snow but these were my grade one students in the czech republic um, this was actually practicing parts of the body so we'd had several lessons where we were looking at body parts 
what they had to do in this lesson was they had to make a snowman, but then we had to walk around and they had to share with, with their snowmen. This is their head, this is the head, this, these are the arms, these are the legs, etc. So they were practicing all of that vocabulary there. Okay, now I think we are pretty much out of time, but the homework that I'm leaving you with is to have a think. What is something that you have heard today that you will use in your classroom next week? So have a think. Ah, I've just seen, we've got a comment about the online workbook. Um, Tatiana, can you put that in the Q&A? Just so that Alex and I've got a little bit more time to answer it because the chat is moving very quickly and your comment is disappearing very fast. So if you put that in the Q&A, we'll make sure we get an example to you. We'll make sure you, we get an answer to you. Okay, fantastic. So I can see some really nice ideas for what people are going to be using with their students next week. That's brilliant. I'm really happy to know that some of the ideas have been helpful for you. So as Alex said, um, my colleagues at Linguist are very happy to help you. If you have any questions about the series, if you want to know anything more about Look or you want to know anything more about projects, about products from National Geographic Learning, you can see their contact details on the slide here. So this is how you can get in touch with them. And if you want to know more about Look as well, the website that Alex shared at the beginning is up at the top there. So to find out more about Look, eltmgl.com forward slash Look. And if you have any questions or you would like any more information, then my colleagues at Linguist will be delighted to help you. Just as a reminder as well, they will be sharing the certificates for this within five working days. So you will receive a certificate participating, um, but be patient, it will be with you soon. Thank you very much, everyone. Perfect, and I'd just like to say thank you as well, Ellie, for stepping in today, doing a superb job, lots of great ideas, and, and really, you know, hitting home that idea or, you know, or the importance or the concept of developing that sense of creativity in our young learners, you know, lives and in the classroom, because it is such an important skill and it's something that they're good at. I think that's really important to stress. And therefore, if they're good at it, they enjoy it, we should sort of tap into that as much as possible. Um, so yeah, thank you to you as well for attending today's session. Um, judging from the comments in the chat box, you all thoroughly enjoyed it. I'm not surprised because Ellie is such a great presenter. So thank you once again to Ellie. And again, just to reiterate what Ellie said, please get in touch with the team at Linguist if you've got any questions. They will be in touch with you with your certificates, okay? So please be patient for those. Um, you will receive an automated email from Zoom um, tomorrow, 24 hours after this session. And that will include a link to the recording, okay? Um, so you can watch it back if you so wish at any point. Um, but the certificate will come at a later date. Okay. So oh, look, maybe some questions in the chat box. Yeah, so that's I've answered the question about the video. So yes, you get the video. Um, so if you missed the start, you will be able to catch up on anything that you missed. Okay, perfect. Thank you ever so much. Um, you know, fingers crossed. I, I was sharing with my colleague Diana earlier um, a picture of me in Kiev exactly three, no, four years ago, 2017, I was stood in the main square and they had like big Easter eggs, everywhere, eggs everywhere. Um, and yeah, I miss that time. So fingers crossed in the not too distant future, we are able to come and visit you in person in Ukraine. Um, so fingers crossed for that. But until then, please stay safe, stay well, um, look after each other and your families and happy teaching. Bye-bye for now. And thank you to Ellie and to all of you.